Hello and welcome to the Nexus Today Show. The hawk returns and is now nesting inside the White House. We're talking about Donald Trump's new national security advisor, John Bolton. Now, the tough-talking neocon who argued for the invasion of Iraq is back. So does this mean war? It's a possibility. His motto for North Korea is strike first, strike hard, before they can get nukes that can reach America. He's also in favor of bombing Iran, tearing up the nuclear agreement, and even regime change. And then there's all the stuff about Russia and China. Well, all that and more here in the Nexus coming up. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Matthew Moore and today in the Nexus we are looking at Donald Trump's new national security advisor, John Bolton. We have a great panel for you, including Professor Scott Lucas, an expert in American studies who says Bolton is bad news for us all. Greg Swenson takes the opposite view, says Bolton has a long history of standing up for good old conservative values. And finally, Will Fisher. Now, he is a highly decorated U.S. Army veteran. He says Bolton is nothing but a draft-dodging warmonger. Well, now we're all together. Let's get reacquainted with the Hawk's Hawk, a.k.a. John Bolton. Breaking news, President Trump has just tweeted, I am pleased to announce Ambassador John Bolton will be my new national security advisor. John Bolton is as interventionist and hawkish as they come. He's more than qualified. He's just a deeply hawkish man. He was an ardent advocate for the Iraq war. He still claims that it was a brilliant decision. I take the threat very seriously. I take the fact that he develops weapons of mass destruction very seriously. There's no question that Saddam sought weapons of mass destruction. Today I've used my constitutional authority to appoint John Bolton to serve as America's ambassador to the United Nations. Iraq's biological weapons program remains a serious threat. Iraq did not have the weapons that our intelligence believed were there. The decision to remove that threat was entirely correct. John Bolton doesn't get it. He still believes in regime change. He's still a big cheerleader for the Iraq war. I think the overthrow of Saddam Hussein that military action was a resounding success. Former ambassador and Fox News commentator John Bolton is Trump's new national security advisor. He's going to be the first person in the president's era on national security and the last person in the president's era on national security. I think John Bolton is a spectacularly bad choice for this job. John Bolton's the right guy at the right time with a worldview that I think will reinforce the president's instincts. Trump ran oh on gosh. a non-interventionist platform. And I was opposed to the war from the beginning of the war in Iraq was a big fat mistake. They said there were weapons of mass destruction, there were none, and they knew there were none. We have seen Bolton for years advocate the most extreme, the most militaristic positions possible. The surest way to avoid conflict uh, is to have a strong military capability. As the ancient Romans used to say, si vis pacem, parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. Well, that pretty much sums up Bolton's approach to the world. Scott Lucas, a quick history lesson before we get into the up-to-date stuff. How important was John Bolton to making the case for the Iraq invasion? Well, John Bolton was important in promoting what was a flawed case. I mean, there were others who really designed it. But Bolton, who had very little diplomatic or foreign policy experience, charged into the United Nations and effectively said, look, the WMDs are there, and if you don't like it, tough. And that not only causes issues over Iraq, it split U.S. from its European allies for years, and it raised questions really about American credibility when it came to diplomacy, well, even up to this day. Greg Spencer, I have to ask you something that's really crying out to be asked, which is how is it Donald Trump can say the Iraq war was a disaster and then go and pick the cheerleader for that war? 
Yeah, it's, it's confusing. But remember, uh, politicians have a, a, a record of campaigning one way and governing in a different way. I'm not supporting it. I'm not advocating it. I thought that, you know, the camp I didn't necessarily support Trump at all during the campaign and didn't agree with a lot of the things he said. But that doesn't surprise me. Um, it's not the first time Trump has said one thing and, and done the other. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to defend. Okay. Greg Swenson, thank you. Uh, let's go to Will Fisher. Will, uh, you served in Iraq as a Marine. Uh, just tell us how that shapes your opinion of John Bolton. Well, absolutely. I, I did serve uh, as a Marine in the war in Iraq. And I ended up in Iraq because of John Bolton and because of his, you know, role as the drum major for the invasion in Iraq. I think it's important to remember that Donald Trump has just now duped all of his supporters who came out and voted for him in the last election because of his saying, I will not be an interventionist president. I am not going to go out and do things like we did in invading Iraq. And now what has he done? He's brought in John Bolton. He's trying to bring in people like Mike Pompeo to lead the Secretary of State. And what Donald Trump is showing is that there is not a shred of daylight between Donald Trump and Dick Cheney. And Will, how does it make you feel when you hear the, the, the former President of the United States, uh, George W. Bush, saying there were no weapons of mass destruction? Well, of course they weren't. I've known that for a long time. Uh, I think that the evidence that was being put forward before I went to Iraq uh, was pretty clear that they weren't there. Uh, it was being presented while I was there, and it was being represented after I returned. Uh, but what we have to remember is that in John Bolton, we have someone who is, at the foundation of their DNA, a warmonger. He cheerleaded for the war in Iraq. He's advocating for war with North Korea. He's advocating for war with Iran. And when he was a college student, he advocated for the war in Vietnam, though he uh, never felt quite compelled okay. enough to go out and actually serve in that war, which makes not only John Bolton a warmonger, but a chicken hawk to boot. We'll get to that a little later in the program. Greg, I, I have to ask you, as a Republican overseas, are you concerned that Bolton and Trump won't work together well? Uh, you know, I think that's a concern that a lot of conservatives, a lot of Republicans have that Trump doesn't work well with anyone. Um, so, you know, we, he's, he's surrounded himself with good advisors, but the turnover has been pretty significant. So, you know, the concern is that you can have a great advisor or you can have a team of advisors, but if you don't listen to them or you just do things, you know, unannounced sure. without counsel, you know, like when he announced that he was going to meet, um, meet in Korea or meet with the, with the leader in Korea. So, you know, it's a little bit confusing for, sure. for people, even on his staff. Scott, I just want to get into the position of the National Security Advisor. We have uh, a very nice little uh, picture here up of uh, Henry Kissinger, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Colin Powell, Condi Rice, and George W. Bush. Just tell our viewers how important this position is. Well, if you try to approach it logically and coherently, the National Security Advisor could be like a Kissinger who is like almost with the president driving U.S. foreign policy. He could be someone who tries to build a consensus amongst advisors, say like a Brent Scowcroft in the 1990s. Uh, he could be, or she could be, as in Condoleezza Rice, someone who was very much a promoter of foreign policy. But that's if it's coherent. And here's the worry. H.R. McMaster, who John Bolton replaced, was one of the last adults in the White House playground, one of the last people who was containing Trump. So now we may have an unprecedented situation, and that is, will the National Security Advisor work with others to try to limit Trump's impulses? Yeah. Or do we have a National Security Advisor who, for the first time, is enabling an impulsive president who can conduct foreign policy by tweet okay. rather than with uh, discussions? Let's take a look at the mechanics of this whole thing then. And, uh, you know, we know Bolton's office is going to be in the West Wing, uh, very close to Donald Trump. And then we have John Kelly, the chief of staff. Now, apparently, he wasn't even informed of the John Bolton appointment until it was publicly announced. Then over in the, uh, the Pentagon, we have Jim Mattis. He reportedly said he's not sure he can even work with John Bolton, although he has subsequently rode back on that. Uh, Greg Swenson, what do you think about the mechanics inside the West Wing now that Bolton's there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it would be really interesting to see what happens. I'm glad, I'm glad uh, Tommy Mattis is, is still in the position. I think that's important to have some other adults, uh, and other, more adult supervision. Uh, everyone's always concerned when, when Trump does things without consulting or, or without going through the proper process. And I think that's been frustrating for Kelly, that's for sure. Uh, I hope he sticks around for a long time because I think we need him. I also think that 
uh, having generals in, in the cabinet and in positions uh, that are close to, to, to the president, I think that's important. And I, and I think, I, I hope Scott would agree with me that, yeah. you know, at least generals have a, an aversion to war. You know, they, they sure. would know better than anyone that, that how, how bad. Well, let, let me that, ask, let me pose know. that to, to Will Fisher. Will Fisher, we've got uh, two gentlemen there, uh, retired generals from the Marine Corps, Mattis, Kelly. Uh, how on earth are they going to work with Bolton? I imagine they have, I don't know, I mean, I'm, certainly a veteran like yourself has a certain amount of, well, I don't know, contempt if the right word, for people who, who cheerlead for war but have never actually experienced it. Oh, contempt is the right word. Uh, I have no issue with people who are opposed to war. With whom, with whom I take issue are those who shirk from their own responsibilities and then go out and advocate for sending other people to war. And I think when you look at a situation like Donald Trump, I don't think he would tweet as capriciously as he does about North Korea if Ivanka Trump was on the Korean Peninsula right now in a flak jacket. Oh, let's get to but North Korea. But she's not. And, in and a recent past, Bolton's argued for a preemptive strike to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons that can reach the United States. Now he's working with Trump. That might have to be a plan B. Let's take a look. Two men with nuclear buttons on their desks, albeit one much bigger than the other, no boasting, counting down to an unprecedented face-to-face -face meeting. Kim Jong-un's offer to talk about nuclear disarmament was relayed to President Trump by a South Korean delegation earlier this month. And he expressed his eagerness to meet President Trump as soon as possible. I think they want to do something. I think they want to make peace. The president will not have the meeting without seeing concrete steps and concrete actions uh, take place by North Korea. It all sounds promising, but has Trump's latest appointment to the White House thrown things into disarray? There's no greater hardliner on North Korea than John Bolton. That's right. Bolton wants a preemptive strike on North Korea before the DPRK has nukes that can reach the United States. And here's how he'd do it. One, blow up the North Korean missiles before they can be launched. Two, initiate cyber attacks on their missile facilities, launch sites, and submarine bases. Three, assassinate North Korea's leadership using special ops or perhaps even airstrikes. And then send in ground forces to secure key locations. And that would require many more troops than the 30,000 or so stationed in South Korea. It all comes at a risk. Many military analysts believe that a potential conflict risks the lives of 25 million people living in South Korea's capital, Seoul. The US government estimates that 10,000 rockets per minute could descend on South Korea. And perhaps even more frightening, experts believe that North Korea has one of the world's most technologically advanced chemical weapons stockpiles in the world, holding sarin, yellow fever, and anthrax. Comfortably within range of US allied Japan and the US territory of Guam. And what if the North has developed a nuclear delivery system? Perhaps Kim Jong-un, with his back against the wall, would be incentivized to use his nuclear weapons first. And what of North Korea's giant neighbor, China? Beijing has said it would defend North Korea if it was attacked first. A terrible prospect that leaves the hawk to deal with the dragon. Uh, militarily, Will, what concerns you about the possibility of a preemptive strike on North Korea? That in the beginning days of a new Korean war, there would be tens of thousands of people dying in South Korea. There would be tens of thousands of American military casualties per day at the beginning of this war, and it would only continue to grow. There is such a huge concentration of life in South mm. Korea, uh, right all the way up to the DMZ. There is a huge concentration of life in North Korea. And if Donald Trump and John Bolton have their way, as we've heard from their remarks, there would be mm. a huge deployment of American ground forces okay. into Korea in the wake of those bombing raids that would result in huge, catastrophic levels of death and destruction. Okay, let's go to Greg Swenson now. Uh, Greg, we've got a picture up, you can't see it at the moment, but it's Kim Jong-un meeting President Xi in China. A lot of people would perhaps give Donald Trump credit for bringing those two together and forcing them to come to the negotiation table, talk about denuclearization and so on. Well, let's leave that point, that point aside. Can John Bolton get on board with this, uh, th these talks 
or do you think he's going to try to derail it and pursue the military option? Of course not. I, I don't think he's, anybody wants to pursue the military option. I think that John Bolton has a habit of may, maybe a, a little bit of saber. You know, he, he likes to rattle the saber because sure. he wants to he wants the other side to know that, that we do have some strength and we do have a strong military, et cetera. I mean, the problem with red lines is you have to, if you draw the red line, you have to execute. That's nobody's intention. I think we all agree on this, on this call, on this conference, that, that nobody wants war in Korea. I mean, you know, Seoul is 30, 30 miles from the DMZ. Everybody knows it. I mean, it's just, I don't think anyone is advocating for war here. What do you think, Scott? I think the problem is, is, is we don't know exactly where the Trump administration is. I mean, Donald Trump decided on impulse. He would meet Kim Jong-un and didn't even consult advisors about it. Now we're in a position where both Koreas and China have got the diplomatic lead. I mean, the, the Chinese leader meeting Kim Jong-un was a sign that they're lined up against the U.S. Now, how does someone like John Bolton react to that? Does he accept that reality, or does he try to reassert American strength? Not necessarily through a military attack, but by saying to China and North Korea, this is what you're going to do. Because trust me, if you come in and wag a finger at him, it isn't going to work. OK, well, let's turn to Iran now. And Bolton's advice there has been similarly hawkish. So, Ambassador, you've written an op-ed today in The New York Times. And here's the headline. It's an eye-catcher. To stop Iran's bomb, bomb Iran. What do you mean? Well, the negotiations, whether they lead to an agreement or not, are not going to stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons. They're so far advanced now, the concessions they've made are so trivial and easily reversible that the deal actually legitimizes Iran's existing nuclear program. Let's go back to Greg Swenson. Now, Greg, it's interesting. UN inspectors have repeatedly certified that Iran is not in breach of the nuclear deal. So what is the Trump administration's problem. You have to rec remember that, that Iran and, and North Korea uh, have, have a, a history of, of agreeing to treaties and lying and, and not fulfilling their obligations. Well, that's, that's actually not true. And the reason why he wants to get rid of the Iran deal is not because Iran is in noncompliance. It's because he wants confrontation with Iran. He wants to, in his eyes, basically back them into a corner the way that he wanted to do with Iraq. The problem is, is if you do that, if you rip up the Iran nuclear deal, at the very least, the Iranians are going to go back to nuclear enrichment, and they will start allying with their forces like Hezbollah in, London, in Lebanon. They will Scott, take you on. If the Americans wanted to bomb Iranian facilities, some of those facilities are buried deep under mountains. Uh, technically, is it even safe to try to do this, and is it even possible? No, look, again, I have to agree with some of the comments that have been made. I would say that, you know, you're talking about uh, somebody saying, well, you know, North Korea and Iran are backing out of deals and they have a history of doing this. Well, the United States, in terms of North Korea, has backed out of some deals as well. And how will it affect diplomatic talks with North Korea if we go and tear up the Iran deal, a deal that is working? This is all about regime change. And what should terrify people is that Donald Trump, being the reality TV star he is, as outside forces like the Mueller investigation and like his ever decreasing popularity begin to close in more and more and more on him, he's going to want to flip the script. And he can go over to John Bolton and say, hey, I'm thinking about tweeting that I'm ready to go to war with Iran. I'm thinking about tweeting that I'm ready to go to war with North Korea. And that will erase the Mueller investigation from the headlines. That will erase my a constantly eroding uh, approval ratings from the headlines. And John Bolton will say, that's a hell of an idea, boss. But yes, to your point, the destruction will occur not only from our bombs and our ordinance that would be going off, but also the ordinance that would be being destroyed that could have potentially devastating effects on the people on the ground. And then, of course, as already been mentioned, this would lead to, th this would require more ground troops being deployed into a country and John Bolton again b being the drum major for an attempted regime change somewhere else in the world. Well, we've looked at Bolton's views on Iran and North Korea, but he actually singles out another country as America's biggest challenge going forward. Good afternoon. Well, it's great to be here, and, uh, and this is, I think, the issue for the United States in the 21st century is how to deal with rising China. Uh, and on the military side, I think it's important uh, as we look at this question that we send China a single, short, clear message. You will never prevail over the United States. 
What, what China is doing is engaging in one of the most massive and uh, rapid military buildups in international history. It's expanding its nuclear weapons capability, it's expanding its ballistic missiles, uh, it's modernizing its extensive conventional forces, it's building the first blue water navy in China's uh, history in the last 600 years, it has one of the world's most extensive cyber warfare programs, one of the most uh, advanced anti-satellite programs to knock our intelligence gathering equipment uh, out, of the, out of the sky. Make no mistake, they are determined to achieve superiority over us and our friends in the East and Southeast Asian region. We need to increase the number of ships in the Navy, upwards of 350. We need massive uh, new capabilities uh, in the air uh, and uh, for our uh, land forces. Uh, the President's taken an important step with his uh, military budget, but a lot more work needs to be done. We need a comprehensive national debate on why preventing China from becoming the dominant world power in the 21st century is something that all Americans should commit to. We believe in peace through strength. We want a strong America. We want Donald Trump to give that to us. Thank you very much. Pay attention, class. OK, Will, the points that John Bolton made there, it's hard to dispute those. Does John Bolton want to go to war when he goes out? and he gets on stage and he talks about these other countries like that. What is he talking about? Is he talking about diplomacy? What I don't think John Bolton, uh, what I think he tries to ignore is that where America works best is when we lead with diplomacy. Look, everybody agrees diplomacy is better, a much better option than, than war. I mean, I don't think anybody on this call or anybody with that same would, would advocate otherwise. Um, and remember, you know, diplomacy works if you have a strong military. And I think that, you know, if you look back at the, at the Reagan years, I mean, the military buildup in the U.S. was significant, and it worked. And, and I don't think that he would have had the ability to Scott, that's a, to, that's to a fair point, isn't it? I mean, if you walk military. quietly and carry a big stick, you're more likely to get your way when you're talking. No, I mean, if I had a student talk like John Bolton, I'd give him an F and kick his butt out the door. Here's the problem, there's two. One is, is that the United States military is larger than the next seven militaries in the world combined. There's not a lack of US military strength because the second point, the reason why China has been so successful, not only regionally but globally, is not through its military, but through its economic foreign policy, for example, its trade policy and supportive development, and through its political strategy, which is precisely to say we don't want conflict, precisely to say we believe in coexistence, and therefore, whenever the U.S. tries to talk tough like Bolton does, China goes to its regional allies and says, hey, do you want to be with Washington that wants a war? Mm. Or do you want a path that is better for all of us? So it's just simply an ill-judged approach okay. that Bolton takes. Thank you, Scott. Well, Bolton and Trump are closely aligned on many issues, but when it comes to Russia, Bolton's been far more aggressive in his criticism, particularly of Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. Everybody who has looked at the classified information says there's no doubt the Russians tried to affect the election. Uh, and, and that's something I think should be unacceptable to all Americans. Russia, Absolutely. China, forget it. So Vladimir Putin looked Donald Trump directly in the eye and lied to him. And I think that's the single most important takeaway coming out of this meeting. Let's go back to Greg now. Greg, uh, what is the important difference here between Trump and Bolton, or are these two going to converge now? Well, I mean, look, you're obviously, you know, absolutely right. I mean, Trump, Trump has been a little too sympathetic to to Russia and to Putin in, during the campaign. Uh, Bolton has always been very much, uh, very concerned about Russia. But to answer your, the other question is, are they going to work well together? Look, I think it's important in any administration, and I think the Republicans are are, are good about this, is having different viewpoints. Uh, it seems that Trump is now putting those cozy days behind him, at least uh, on the face of it, willing to uh, expel 60 diplomats uh, in solidarity with the British. Uh, is this a significant move in that direction? No, because Trump didn't favor that. It was ah. the U.S. agencies that favored that. Okay. It was the Defense Department. It was the National Security Council. And here's the point. I mean, Greg's statement just now was a really incredible way of trying to cover up chaos. The fact is, is that you've got a president who has been very close to and will not criticize Vladimir Putin, whereas you have agencies that are concerned with a Russian campaign of hybrid warfare, information warfare, cyber warfare, and military steps. Now, which wins out? 
Does Bolton actually work well with the agencies? Does he actually work well with any adult who is left in the playground? Or does he try to enable Trump, which only causes more chaos? Will mentioned Chicken Hawk at the beginning of the program, and I think it might be a cultural reference to this old vintage cartoon. I'm a rootin', tootin', lasso loopin', popgun shootin' chicken hawk. Ah, there's my victim now. What do you think, Will? That's from uh, Foghorn Leghorn, years and years ago when we were all little boys. A tiny little chicken hawk running around trying to be tough and puffed up. Is that what you were thinking about? It is uh, a perfect example of what people like Donald Trump and John Bolton are. People who love war, except when it comes to their lives actually being right. on the line. Well, Donald Fisher. Trump went to great lengths to avoid service in Vietnam. Thank you very much, Will Fisher. Thank you, Greg Swanson and Professor Scott Lucas. Thank you for your contribution to the Nexus one more time. Appreciate it. And that is all we have time for from the Nexus for now. Thank you for watching. See you next week.